Okay, so this video we're going to look at the process of ecological secession and discuss primary versus secondary secession. So let's get started. You know, what does secession even mean? Let's use another example first. If I were to ask you what president seceded Jimmy Carter, I hope you would know, oh, that was Ronald Reagan. Who seceded Ronald Reagan? That was George Bush Sr. Who seceded George Bush Sr.? That was Bill Clinton. Who seceded Bill Clinton? That was George Bush Jr. Who seceded George Bush? That was Barack Obama. And who seceded Barack Obama? We have Donald Trump. So in this example, secede means to follow. And that's what secession means. We're going to keep that in mind as we go through this. So let's look at primary secession. You know, the definition is pretty straightforward. It's the establishment and the development of an ecosystem in an uninhabited area. So here's an uninhabited area. And what happens is this ecosystem is going to go through a series of changes. So small life begins to grow and then a little bigger and then a little bigger and then a little bigger. How does this gradual series of changes occur within this environment? That's what this video is going to discuss. So when it comes to primary secession, there's really two modes in which this is going to occur. And, and that's through volcanic lava creating new land. You know, here's an area. Let's add some plants and let's add some animals. And let's say in the background of this area, there's an erupting volcano. And as, uh, as time goes by, this volcano is erupting. The lava is flowing into the ocean and it starts to pile up and pile up and pile up and pile up. You know, eventually this lava is going to cool and harden. And when this lava cools and harden, it hardens into new barren land. Now, this land, this rock, it's not going to stay barren forever. It's going to go through primary secession. And we'll talk about that in just a few moments. You know, here we have a, uh, a picture of some lava flowing into a body of water, probably into an ocean. And eventually this lava is going to cool and solidify and eventually you can walk around on it. And eventually this will turn into, you know, a wilderness ecosystem. Well, another way in which primary secession can proceed is through glacial retreat. You know, here we have a frozen, a frozen glacier. And as the seasons change and the temperatures of, of this planet are warming up, this glacier is retreating. And when it does, it exposes new barren land. Now, the land is barren currently, but after primary secession, uh, we're going to see a wilderness ecosystem begin to grow and live in this area. Now here's a great picture from 1909 taken from a glacier in Alaska. Watch how the picture changes almost a hundred years later. Notice how the glacier has retreated and the barren rock is actually very full of green vegetation in this picture. So how does this process occur? Well, let's start with uh, actually the volcano example. Let's use a, a, here's some lava flowing into an ocean. And eventually this lava is going to cool and harden into rock or, or land. And here again we have the, the rock has hardened, the lava has hardened, and it's barren. Uh, a, a, it looks like a, a vast barren wasteland right now. So the first organisms to inhabit this barren rocky world are what are called pioneer species. Now, if I ask you what's a pioneer? Well, here, here's an example. Lewis and Clark were European pioneers that first explored westward across America all the way to the west coast of California. Alexander Fleming, Sir Alexander Fleming, was a pioneer in medicine. He helped to develop the first ever antibiotic called penicillin. And Elvis Presley was a pioneer in rock and roll. These three examples nicely show what a pioneer is. They're one of the first to come along. And in this case, pioneer species are the first organisms to inhabit this new land. Now, I'm not talking about the people in the picture. I'm talking about uh, other organisms that encounter this, er this area and begin to grow. So what organisms are even capable of growing 
in a vast wasteland? Well, moss would be one. Here's a picture of moss growing on a rock, and lichen is another. Lichen is a mixture of, uh, of a bacteria, a algae-like bacteria, and a fungus living together mutually. But these two organisms are able to grow and live on, on barren rock. And so moss and lichen are commonly called pioneer species because they can live in this environment where other organisms just can't. And so if we look at this rocky land here, how do the moss and lichen get into this new, uh, this new newly created piece of land here? Well, through the wind. As uh, wind and rain and weather will carry the reproductive cells of moss and lichen, their spores, and they're carried through the wind and eventually, they're, and carried through rain, and eventually they settle in this area here, and then they begin to grow. And so lichen and, and moss actually come in these real pretty colors. Here's some white and reds. Here's some kind of yellowish greens. Uh, here's some you know, kind of lime green colors. So I'm going to illustrate moss and lichen in my animation here with the gold, the red, the green squiggly lines. Those are moss and lichen that are growing on this barren wasteland of, a, of an environment right here. Well, as time passes, moss live, die, uh, live, reproduce, and die. Uh, lichens live, reproduce, and die, and their dead matter accumulates as do pieces of crumbling rock. So over time, this accumulation of dead organic matter from moss and lichen and the crumbling of rocks forms a real thin layer of soil. Not enough soil for big old trees and, and you know redwood trees and oak trees and things like that to grow, but enough to stimulate the production of even more moss and lichen. And so what was once a vast, uh, rocky, barren wasteland is slowly starting to show signs of life. And so as the process continues, eventually seeds are going to enter this area and begin to grow. Now, how do the seeds get there? Well, one way is through birds. Birds will eat fruit and then poop out the seeds. And as they fly overhead and they poop out the seeds, the seeds land in this new area. Another way, many seeds are transported via wind. Many seeds have little like blades on them that help them catch the wind and, and glide and travel vast distances. And so here come some seeds that just entered. And now that the seeds have entered this new land, the seeds begin to grow. The seeds begin to grow into small flowers and small shrubs. And over time, as flowers you know, lose their petals, as these shrubs shed their leaves, all of this accumulates on the ground and adds even more thickness to the soil. And so as time passes, you know, the flowers reproduce, the shrubs reproduce. Again, there's another flower reproducing. And as time passes, the layer of soil becomes even thicker because you have years and years and years now of growth just accumulating through flower petals and decaying leaves and moss and lichen decaying, rocks crumbling and adding to the soil. And so with this new environment come animals. Animals, of course, are always looking for new habitats, new areas to hide from their predators and new food sources. And wherever there's herbivores, you better believe carnivores are going to follow in search of prey. So what was once a rocky, barren wasteland is slowly developing into a thriving ecosystem. And as even more time passes, small trees begin to take root. Again, how do the seeds get there? Well, through wind and through bird droppings. And so small trees over the, over the decades uh, begin to grow in this area. And that adds even more thickness to the soil because, again, now you've got another few decades of, of moss and lichen accumulating, another few decades of flower petals and leaves and uh, rocks crumbling, and now you have mouse droppings and snake droppings, and all of this, all of this adds to the thickness of the soil which allows even taller plant life to begin to grow. And of course, where there's more vegetation and more plants, there's more habitats for animals. So birds might now migrate into this area and insects might take advantage. And let's say a little squirrel uh, migrates and, and runs up into this tree here. 
And eventually we reach the climax community. Notice how the soil became even thicker because as the decades go by, more and more organic matter accumulates. More and more soil accumulates on the ground and larger trees begin to take root. How do the seeds get there? Wind carries them, rain carries the seeds, bird droppings carry the seeds. And over time, you get these massive, huge, tall canopy trees. And uh, sadly, the, these tall canopy trees will often outcompete and overcrowd some of the original vegetation that was there. And now that these tall canopy trees are blocking all the sunlight, you start to see some of the death of the ground level vegetation. And this is characteristic of a climax community. And of course, this bigger trees and bigger habitats allows even more animals to inhabit this forest. So bunnies and rabbits come along and, and owls fly in. And so now we have a thriving ecosystem where let's say maybe 100, 150, 200 years ago, this might have been just barren, uh, a barren wasteland, barren rock. So that was primary secession. Now let's start with secondary secession. So you know, it's a change that takes place after a disturbance occurs in an established ecosystem. So here's our climax community that we just finished talking about. And let's say a disturbance happens. Maybe it's a forest fire, a flood, some type of disturbance. And in this case, uh, we're going to show you that the secondary secession process is just much faster because the soil still exists. So in this case here we have a lightning strike and it starts a fire and a, oh man we have this wildfire and of course birds are going to fly away and whatever animals can can run away and eventually you know this fire is going to spread and eventually could be the death to some of these trees here and eventually as time goes by as fuel runs low eventually the fire goes out well once the fire is out notice how the soil still remains so secession is going secondary secession is going to reestablish this ecosystem so as time passes you know, grasses begin to grow. Again, seeds drift there, drift in the wind and through rain and, and through the droppings of animals. And eventually small shrubs and bushes and flowers will begin to regrow. And eventually trees will regrow. And wildlife will come back and, and reoccupy this area. This is secondary secession. And eventually we come back to our climax community where, because the trees are so tall and dense, they actually might crowd out some of the smaller vegetation. The ecosystem has reestablished itself after this disturbance. That's secondary secession. You know, here's a real nice series of pictures that were taken that nicely show secondary secession after a forest fire. So this picture right here was taken one year after this fire was extinguished. Well now here's the same area two years after the fire. Here's the area three years after. Four years after. Notice how the ecosystem is reestablishing itself. Here's five years after. Six years after. Seven years after. Eight years after, you see, as time passes, more and more and more growth accumulates. And as time continues, this environment will be reestablished. And that's secondary secession. You know, another example of secondary secession is like when a tree falls. When a tree falls in a, in a forest, that leaves a big gap in the canopy. And that gap is a resource for other trees because if, if you can grow and occupy that gap, you have access to sunlight. And so as a tree falls through the act of secondary secession, other organisms will reoccupy and, and fill in that gap. And it might be a different species of tree. It could be the same species of tree, but eventually that gap gets filled in and the ecosystem is reestablished. You know, there's some real interesting examples of secondary secession. Uh, you know, here's a picture of the town Pryipyat in Ukraine, which is the location of the Chernobyl nuclear power plant, which experienced a, a nuclear meltdown in 1986. So this city has been abandoned since 1986. And you can see in the plaza here, plants and vegetation are beginning to grow. Plants are overgrowing in, in all areas. And the, uh, the, the ecosystem is beginning to regrow and reestablish itself after years of human uh, neglect. 
you know, speaking of neglect, here we have urban decay. And here's a picture in New Jersey. Again, you can see in areas that aren't well maintained, you can see the, the sidewalk is crumbling and plants are beginning to break through and and life and the, the life in this once ecosystem is trying to reestablish itself. You know, if I'm not careful, I can get sucked into Wikipedia and read about these all day, you know, abandoned farms and ghost town. You know, here's a farm that was abandoned. You know, at one time, this farm was, was you know, cultivated and had crops, but after being abandoned and, uh, and neglected, the ecosystem began to reestablish itself in this area here. So there you have it, primary versus secondary secession. If you're in my biology class, pause the video and uh, you know try these and let me check your answers and see how you did and, and I hope you enjoyed the video. Thanks for watching.